The Central Club. What's going on, people? Welcome to the Central Club. This episode is brought to you by Reinspire Printing. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the club, and hit the bell button to be notified of future content. Today, we've got a wonderful guest all the way down from lovely Manchester. This guest I've been trying to get on for a very, very long time, and seeing this the year of my third year anniversary, we're sticking to that drug addiction story. This one is one hell of a story, and I hope you enjoy this. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome... Mr. Lee Marvin Hitchman. Thank you very much. Well, welcome for having me. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Cole. Thank you Appreciate for coming that. down. Yeah, man. I know it's, you know, it's a long way, Cardiff. Yeah, it is a long way, yeah. You know, from Manchester. And uh, yeah, I really man. appreciate you taking your time yeah. to come down. Yeah, it's good, man. How are you? I'm all right, man. I'm all right. Ticking over. Good to be here. Yeah? Pleased to be here to yeah. meet you. The man who interviewed uh, the Godfather. Um <laughs> Uh, what's his name? Um, Go on. What's his name? Um, I forgot the name of the boy's name. Um, <laughs> da, 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 da. What's his name now? My friend, um, the father. What's his name? The father. What's he called? Um, the, the drum and bass father. Oh, devil man. Devil <laughs> man. That's it. <coughs> the drum and bass father. The drum you like and devil bass man, father. yeah? Yeah, man. He's one of the he's old He's a school. character, isn't he? Very, very good. Very, very good little lines he's got. I like yeah, you know, He's yeah. listened to him a few years ago and he kicked off. I went off, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. Good, 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 good. Yeah, man. No, listen, it, it feels good because, you know, ever since um, seeing your Lad Bible interview, yeah, um, very, very powerful. If anyone hasn't seen it, please go and see it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the other the other interviews you've done on YouTube as well, I've just been really wanted to speak to you really because... I like to speak to other addicts who have like come through the other side and stuff. And That's I think right. it's good to talk and raise more awareness. Definitely, mate. So, yeah, of course. You know, you've done Lad Bible. You've now released a book, which is number one. Yeah, it's number one in its relevant category. Yeah, um, disabilities and something else. Yeah, it's number one. Yeah, That's so well made up with that. Congratulations. Yeah. I don't want to give away the title. Okay. Because I'm going to ask you this question, okay. which we all ask everyone is, yeah. is basically, you know, Take us back from the beginning. Where was you born? Where was I born, right? So my adoption file tells me that uh, my mum was a prisoner. Um, she was a teenage prisoner in HMP style, pregnant with me. Um, she was being told that if she gave the baby away, the baby was being given to two doctors. Um, and I believe my dad was also in prison as well. So my mum had escaped from Holloway and they sent her up north. So she was in style. Or she escaped from one prison, a woman's prison in, in, in London. So they sent her up to style and I was up there pregnant and my dad was in a, in a prison in, in London side. Um, so yeah, it says on my, it says my adoption file that I was born in distress. Um, so that was a bit weird. It really clicked into place that when I said a born in distress, because when I was a uh, when I was a baby, I used to wrap my arms around my pillow and bang my head repeatedly off a pillow. I'd probably count to like a thousand before I fell asleep. Um, so I always knew that um, I was a bit troubled as a baby. Do you know what I mean? Like I was always very al alone. Like I was deep in my own thoughts. Do you know what I mean? Um, I had an adoptive sister. She was a bit older than me, five years older, which is quite a big when you're a kid. So I didn't really connect with her. Obviously, she was my friend, but she was five years older than me. You know what I mean? It was a telling age difference. So, yeah, um, I went to a Welsh woman. I didn't go to two doctors, by the way. My dad was a factory worker, like a factory line worker. Worked on his own on a factory line for like 25 years. And my mum was just a stay at home mum who used to like foster babies. Um, so I had, there was a lot of babies going through the house when I was a baby, you know what I mean? Lots and lots of kids going through. And now I've found some old pictures with old little Chinese babies and little black babies, you know, who they've had in the house and stuff, which, you know, was a nice thing for my mum to want to do, you know what I mean? Little Welsh woman from Abergavenny, heart of gold. She was Welsh. Uh, Welsh, taught pure Welsh, very, very strong Welsh accent she still had. She and kept and where, it all was you, alive. where was you living at that time? Manchester, yeah. My mom, yeah, yeah. She'd moved up to Manchester. She had a she she told me whispers of her having a been in a really bad relationship. Uh 
losing a baby, being thrown down the stairs and losing a baby. So they took her insides out so she couldn't have kids. And that's why she chose me. She told me that story herself. Do you know what I mean? Wow. I never forgot that. Yeah. So what a wonderful woman to, you know, take in babies. And, uh, and, and when, what, sure. what, so what would she do is she would take him in, kind of look after him and then uh, find other families? Yeah, they'd move on then to somewhere else. Yeah, they'd move on to somewhere else. And she kept you, did she? She adopted me, though. I was different. She went to the orphanage for me because she used to tell me the story that the orphanage was a really, really strict place. Um, she said uh, it was... She said it was a really strict place and it wasn't very nice to you there. That's what she said to me. Um, so I picked up on it and then I spoke to my old man about it later on and he told me a story and said, they went down there once after four o'clock and they got told the babies a lot's at four o'clock. They're not seen after four. So they got the, they, they took it on that the babies a lot away at four and then they're not dealt with them until the next day. Do you know what I mean? So... Kind of a rough place, yeah. But it was, uh, it's going to be right near the prison because obviously they're getting a lot of prison babies in there, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you know where your mother, was your mother from London, did you say? Yeah, my mum was originally, my birth mum, yeah, she was a London girl, yeah. Um, Was she white, black, because you, you're mixed race yourself? Um, She was a, um, she was from Cyprus. She was a Greek Cypriot, yeah. Greek Cypriot, yeah. Yeah, like you, Greek boy, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, she's Greek Cypriot, bless her. She, she's, she's gone. Yeah, she's gone now. But Well, it's a fascinating uh, way to come into the world, I must yeah. say. Um, yeah. And this is the book, Born in Prison. Um, yeah. Where can everyone get this book now? Amazon. It's available on Amazon now. If you can Google Born in Prison, it will come up on Google. UK can just... Um, Go to Amazon and just put Born in Prison. I'll put my name in Lee Marvin Hitchman and it'll come up. It's doing really, really well. Um, it went to number one at first on the um, hot new releases. Then it went down to, stayed in the top 10 and it stayed in the top 10 for two weeks. It's been dropping to five to eight to three to, now it's gone back up to one now, you know what I mean? Brilliant. I've got, but thankfully I've got a couple of people off my estate who are helping me, you know what I mean? Like local, local lady, local women and stuff, you know, strong Great Fantastic, women. yeah. You know I mean? It says, how I survived shootings, stabbings, prison, crack addiction, Manchester gangs, and dog attacks. Yeah, the dog attacks are the ones. Cool. <laughs> I mean, you can just look at my legs. I, I can see, yeah. You can see the holes in my legs off dogs, yeah. I've got scars from the top of my legs to my bottom off dogs, yeah. Well, we might dive into some of these stories. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But what I'm going to ask you is, like, when was you yourself conscious of your birthplace? How old well, was you? I was very young. I was very young. I was told that I was a very special baby and that I was picked. But only when I got a bit older did uh, the whisper that I was born in prison come around. I think I was a teenager when I heard, first heard the story that I was born in prison. Was right. this was this through family or was this like yeah yeah well just known the talking no 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 my family never told anyone yeah. that I was adopted or born in prison or anything like that. That was kept in the family. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I've, I never told anyone my story for many, many years, do you know? Colin? Yeah. I didn't tell, you know, you don't talk your business to you, so, you know, I just kept it to myself. Never thought it was anything special, you know what I mean, until much later in my life and realised that it's a lot of trauma you're dealing with very, very young, do you know what I mean? So I can remember this bush, I, it was a berry bush local to me, this big black berry bush, and I used to pick it a lot. And I'd pick this bush and I'd pull these berries off the bush and I'd think, I'm the berry, where's my tree? Where's my bush? Yeah. You say that, say that again, sorry, man. So what I'd do is I'd go to a berry bush, what was local to me, and I'd see these berries on the bush, and I'd pick the berries off. I'd hold them in my hand, and I'd look at the berries, and i think, where's my bush? Where's my tree? Because I'm coming from somewhere, right? And I knew yeah, that. Yeah, my yeah, mum yeah. told me I was picked. She picked me. You picked like a cherry. So I picked a berry. I was picking a berry. the berries. I'm thinking, right, I'm picked. So here's what you pick. But you pick something from somewhere, don't you? you That's pick, really... It's, it's deep, in it, for a baby, for yeah. a child? You know, if you look for at a young an analogy stuff, and stuff, that's really A, young, a younger and younger to um, think about stuff <clears throat> like that, yeah. So I remember um, being a troubled little baby. Um, I used to wee the bed a lot. I used to get this reoccurring dream that I was 
mopping the floor in the kitchen. And I'd wake up and I'd be piss wet through, you know what I mean? And I'd have to get the wrath of my dad then, because my dad uh, was a bit, he was a bit sadistic, really. He was a bit of a madman, you know, not, a, not, he wasn't a nice man. And I mean, no part of him was a nice man. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have no friends. He never built relationships other than his wife. He didn't like me, you know, he didn't like my sister. You know, he was not many people we ever talked to, you know what I mean? He was a very, very loner man, you know, so. But what frustrated me with him is he, he used violence against me to try and get me to stop we in the bed. And I, I used to think to myself, he's not my dad, why is he beating me? Why has he chose me? And then he's going to turn around and start doing stuff like that, do you know what I mean, Cullen? So, yeah, it was a bit torn by that stuff growing up. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, it's an hard one, isn't it? Looking back now, like it's obviously your mother was an amazing person. Yeah, she was the one. The yeah. father was a bit different, obviously. Yeah, you get that in twisted. many households where, you know, there's the favourites and stuff. Of course. Looking back now, if you look in this day and age, do you think, this is, might be a, you know, quite a controversial mm. question, but do you think that your mother and father would be eligible for someone like you in this day and age with like the protection we have and all that? Or do you still think, you know, they would have been able to adopt? Um, I think my dad would have been sent to prison for what he did to, to people growing up. That's how, how much he went left field, you know what I mean? Really? Yeah, because, I mean, we had cousins in inverted commas. One of my mum's friends was yeah. a Scottish woman from the Garbles, and she was called, I won't say her name, but anyway, she was from the Garbles. Yeah. And um, that was my auntie. So all her kids was like my age. And I can remember my dad beating one of the girls and beating her that bad that the social services got called and, taught, and he told him to leave her alone. Wow. Yeah, and she remembers to this day, she tells me that story to this day, which is quite sad to hear, you know what I mean? And like, uh, yeah. like none of them go to see him now, you know what I mean? Um, he's still alive then? He's still alive, yeah. Now he's in a care home, yeah. But what's been crazy is it's been left to me to deal with all his affairs. Um, his family, he used to go walk to go and see every few weeks, you know what I mean? Um, I spoke to one of them family members recently and they kind of disowned him and said, we hardly knew him anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, he used to go down there. That's Like I say, he didn't really have a big circle of friends. people or family or friends. And he used to walk a few miles to go and see the family members, you know what I mean? And um, I pulled him, I said, why didn't you help me like when he was, like when he was ill and pooing himself in the house and weeing himself. It's funny it's calling because when I used to wee, wee myself, he'd, try, he'd go sick, yeah? And I'm watching him wee himself and I've got to find that humanity to not, not do anything to him because I'm not cut from the same cloth as him, Cullen. So I'm not the same as him. Do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't do what he does. You get it? So I'm not going to treat him like he treated me. Right? So when he's weeing himself, I'm washing him down with respect. Yeah? Having to take his underwear off and his trousers. Giving him respect. Thinking, you never give me one, one dot of respect when I weed the bed, you'd embarrass me and you'd belittle me and make me feel terrible. So it's funny, isn't it? Do you think he sits there when you're washing him down thinking, like, do, you, do you think he knows about it? Do you think he, he does? He does, he knows. Oh, he knows. A million percent he knows because he tries, he's tried to be extra nice. And when I pulled him about what he used to do to me, He'd fiend, um, I can't really remember, all right? But I was speaking to a neighbour the other day, who's still a neighbour to the to my family home, right? And um, this will blow your mind, but it's the God's honest truth. His first memory, yeah? He said to me, Marv, my first memory of my childhood is we was about three or four years of age and we was playing 
outside and we came in your living room and your dad ran at you, grabbed you, grabbed a piece of bamboo, snapped it and started beating you around the room and he beat you that, that much around the room, I ran out and ran home scared. That's what he told me. That's his earliest memory of anything. Fucking hell. That's yeah. what he remembers, his earliest memory, you know. So um, <clears throat> hearing stories like that, knowing I treat him with dignity and respect, is like, so the care home phone me up and say, he needs a pair of slippers because, you know, his slippers are a bit uncomfortable and I think, a pair of slippers, mate. Do you understand? Like, you don't even know the levels to this. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't understand the levels. Like, like he wouldn't said. ask me for a pair of slippers because he knows, like, he knows, yeah. like, what he, you know, he knows but, that. But, but it's like you said, isn't it? You're cut from a different class. I am, Colin. You know? Whether it was blood-related or not. That's it. That's you can it. still be different to what you're... I'm different. I'm not cut from that. I would not treat him, even, even now... Um, when he doesn't deserve the respect, I'll still give him that respect. You know what I mean? And mm. I will till he dies and people will say I'm crazy or I've got a bit of fingy syndrome or whatever. But, Stockholm um, syndrome. Stockholm syndrome. Maybe I, maybe I had a bit of that, yeah. But when you've had nothing and you've only got to get a little bit, it's better than nothing, yeah. isn't it? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're human, man. Something's better than nothing, isn't it, cool? That's it. What does um, abuse like that do to a person when they're older? Um, I think it makes you realise how good a person you are eventually. You come to realise that you're a good person because you're not like that. You don't do that. Do you know what I mean? So I would never, ever beat my kid. It just wouldn't even enter my brain. It wouldn't even enter my brain to raise my voice to him. You know what I mean? I'd talk to him with respect. If he did something wrong, I'd tell him it's wrong and explain to him why it's wrong, do you know? More than, like, using violence. So a perfect example is my boy's autistic, ADHD. He plays up 24-7, you know. If that's anything like I was, my dad was just beating around the house an autistic child, yeah. Yeah, Times have changed. When now. you look at it like that, you get like, labels fuck. now. You get labelled now. So thankfully, the kids get given a label now, so they're protected more. Do you know? Yeah, it's like it's like a, it's pros and cons to it, isn't it? Like everything is labelled now, but at yeah. the same time, there's, it's like we've been given answers and understanding to things. That's it. You know, yeah. dyslexia was not a thing, and that's ADHD. it. And mental health wasn't even a thing a no. few years ago. I mean, like my partner, um, Kira, she she suffers mental health, and she's been going to mental health team for like over ten years, wow. a bit longer even, and it was rare as end teeth then. Do you know what I mean? And she was very, very clever by, she identified that she had a problem. She went and tried to catch it early, do you know what I mean? And nip it in the bud. And now she's got it under control by like medication. Do you well, know that's what I mean? good. I think a lot, that's what people need to hear what you just said then, because yeah. a lot of people will deny it to a point where. Yeah, well that's or it. they're scared. And, they're scared. And, there's and, a lot of fear in it, isn't there? There's a lot of fear in like facing up to what you really are. And like I always say, I say everybody has got, suffers mental health. It's just what levels it comes out like of Like a yeah. spectrum. It's a spectrum. Every one of us on the planet would say, yeah, that's what I meant to love. Sometimes I sit there, well, I can't it is, sleep. Because we're all human and we all we have all health. think the same, right? It's just, yeah, how, it, how, how are you looking at it? Sometimes it deteriorates. Yes. So, you know, you suffer mental health, right? So, and I just yeah. want to say briefly, shout out to your wonderful partner as well. Like she's, she seems yeah. like she does a, a lot of support for you and she's been through a hell herself. She has. She's been through a you lot, know, yeah. Um, and she helps me a lot. She helps me a lot. I mean, my physical health is not the best, you know, with a damaged spine. Um, through the balloons, kids, so be careful of them nitrous yeah, well, oxide. Well, remind me about that. We'll jump into that. Yeah, I've got a bit to say about that, yeah. And okay, then. research. So your upbringing was, was pretty much... Yeah. There was a bit of trauma there, definitely. Right. Um, what about your troubled teens? You know, when did your te when did you start to be troubled in your teens? Wow, oh, God. Uh, teens, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so 13. By 13, I was doing street robberies. I was in the city centre robbing people. Uh, I'd been convicted for robbery at 13. Wow. My first street robbery. Um, I was already being sexually abused by a paedophile by then. Well, that was going on. 
Um, I was having to keep that a secret from the age of 11. Are you able to go into any of that? Or sure, I can talk about it. Happen, like, like, wow, how did that happen? But can you so, like, paint a picture? Because in the sense, it's we're sim- school. We're, like, we're, it's like, a very, very simple, very easy thing for it to happen. I was 11. We moved house. Okay. Only moved half a mile. But to me, different area. Di- a bridge or bridge separating it, you know, a hill separating it, different people. So um, I was hanging around there, the flats, there's these big four flats, right, where I overlooked our house and estate. So I met this guy called Andy and um, black curly hair and he started talking, befriending me and stuff. And he had this um, games console thing, like a computer, I don't know what you put tapes in, one of them old, old, old things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, he said to me, like, he had games for it. And he took me to his, I'll never forget, he took me to his bedroom. And he was searching around and he was kept looking out the window. And I just, I, you know, I just thought, well, you know what I mean? And he said to me, oh, I ain't got the games for it. My mate's got the games for it over the way. And he took me to this flat. And he was like a, a an old man in his 50s. And he had the, a mum like at the end of the hallway watching TV snooker in like her 80s. And basically he just grabbed hold of me, pulled me into this bedroom, dragged this big wooden toolbox behind the door um, and just started licking my face and um, overpowered me, tore my clothes off me, ripped my clothes off me and molested me and raped me, you know what I mean? And, the, the old um, man or Andy? The old man. The old man. Andy'd gone. What, and Andy was kind he'd of just like gone. the coerce. Yeah, he'd just gone. I think he... Yeah. He'd probably been abused himself. He'd probably been abused himself. That's what I think. Yeah, and he was probably being paid to bring kids and whatnot to him. Wow. You know what I mean? And that went on. That happened because I went to school. I went to school, came home from school, and he was in my house. What? He came round to say, to thank, thank my mum for... Him having such a nice boy for going shot for his mum the day before. Because <laughs> that was a Sunday the day before, and it was a Monday that day. So he blagged it like that. And then he was, because he's flat overlooked our house, he used to stand on his balcony, literally, and wave, wave. And I'd be in my garden. And he'd literally wave me. What a fucking scumbag. And when I got old enough to build up the power to do anything, um, he was dead. His mum died first, and then he died a few, about a year later, he died. I was building up that strength as well. But I'll tell you what, what really, really rips my head apart about the whole episode is the caretaker of the flats, right? He lived opposite this man, and he used to see us school kids going in and out of the house. Because I used to see him in in the lift. Name beginning with J with big curly hair, and I used to see him, and I'd look at him and think, "Do you realise that we're being abused in that flat, and you're the caretaker? Like, do you not supposed to take care of people and the, the building? It's you know what I mean." Mm. He never said a word. Just used to let on to him, like, All right, mate. To the, and what to area the was this? This is in my area where I'm from, uh, Miles Platin. I moved from Ancoats to Miles Platin and the flats are in Miles Platin, yeah. So to oh. this day, the overlook, the elsewhere, what I grew up in, you know. So going on to the armed robberies and stuff, do you think all... Not like, armed robberies. Uh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> do you think the Robert street robberies and all this I was rebelling, stuff, we was rebelling, of yeah, course. Do you yeah. think that like the abuse from your father and then the abuse is, is, is like a connection to where you went in your well, life? Well, of course, yeah, because I used to run away a lot. When I was younger, me and another kid called Bernard, who's dead now, very, very close friend. My girlfriend, he's, um, he's got the same surname as him. Yeah. Um, yeah, me and him used to play around a lot and I've go on lots of adventures and whatnot. And um, I used to run away a lot. So we'd run away down to the red light area. We'd go down there and we'd watch all the prostitutes working. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and we, we got to rolling um, punters. You know, with the girls, the girls are saying, do you want to do a rob and rob his money and take his wallet? We'd be down there when he was drunk and rob the money. <laughs> and then when I started getting a little bit older, I'd use it as like my base, you know, to go to and like a place where I could always know 
there's access to money, there's access to drugs, because the prostitutes are making so much money, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? And it's an easy crime to be mad because there's a lot of drunks about and you can just take the wallet and run off. And that's what we used to do. I'd do 10, 15 robberies in a day mm. on the weekend. Street and I suppose robbers. half of them don't want to report because they're... Well, they don't they, report because they they're, they're, they're with a prostitute, aren't they, basically? Yeah. Or they're on the prostitute area. So, because mm. I'd make sure, like... So, years ago, I met this old working girl, right? And she told me, she said, Marv, there's two rules. She said, you don't hit the girls and you don't take the money. And I laughed at it. I thought, everyone's going to do that to him. And I got on it that it's the two most important things in their lives, yeah. You don't hit them and you don't take what they're earning. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it stuck with me all my life. And I, I used that as my guide, like a little moral compass within me. Do you know what I mean? So I'd never hit them girls as much as like the cheeky and the ruthless and they try and yeah. hit pocket you know, and all that. I'd never use violence against them because they're used to that all day. I wouldn't be banding sex off them because they're used to that all well, that's day. What a, that's what a pimp is um, based on, isn't it? Backhand, yeah. bitch Yeah, slap, all that shit, you know, yeah. Pimp slap. And right, so, so you get a few lads who come get out of okay. jail and come to, on the beat and try and be like that with the girls. Do you know what I mean? And they just, they, the girls would be right on the phone to 999. They wouldn't give a shit. They'd phone the police and get him locked up for robbery. Mm. Because they'd think, he's losing me my money. He's robbing my punters, my customers. I'm just going to get him locked up. And that's what they'd do. Yeah. They'd phone 999 and get him locked up. Or they'd see the vice squad on the street and keep him on the word and say, yeah, he's doing robberies. In, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like naughty ones, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like one of my mates used to run up to the punters with the girls and just fly kick them, the punter. Just straight fly kick them in the head and just knock them out. And <laughs> beat them up and just rob the money. He ended up getting 12 years. Because he was doing oh, just violent, crazy robbing. It's like, what is the need? Yeah. You could done, could have done them just as easy, just going up and taking his money off. Him. Yeah, yeah, and he was just doing crazy ones, you know. When he got too violent for the. So street. you were kind of like a protector for these these young girls and well, all that. You are not you? so much as a protector. Just if I, if I went to town, I'd be getting in. Oh, I'd be getting in vehicles. Okay, so my graph was um, getting in cars. So I used to go to car showrooms. Colin. Breaking into cars, yeah. Yeah, well, if it right, here's what I did first. First, I used to have a Shatterstone. Okay. Oh, like a bus. Uh, oh, little, yeah. Yeah. yeah right. I won't say what it is, so I don't want the kids to find out that, that like, you can break <laughs> yeah, windows yeah, that yeah, easy. Yeah, so right. I'm not going to say what it is. But there is a, there yeah, is a so summit yeah. what you can use to break windows extremely easy. And um, I used to walk around with them all the time, right? Okay. And um, if the police had pulled me out to swallow them, and never, ever, you know. But then I started going to car showrooms. And looking at the cars in a showroom now, you think of this, every door's open in a car showroom, sure. right? I'd remember the catches all along all the doors. So Toyota catches, you see a little red thing. Any BMW, if there's a catch up, it means all the doors and the boots open. That, like their models it's changed now. Some models, like the doors are... Right, so anyway, I got onto the catches on the doors on vehicles and that was my graft. I could walk, I'd walk down the street I'd see which car doors are open. I'd walk right round. I'd come to the car like it was my own, get in the driver's seat, open the glove box, take out anything valuable, pop the boot under the seats, pop the boot, take the things out of the boot, slam the boot and just walk away. And that's me. I'd clear the car out, all the valuables. You'd come back to your car. You wouldn't know your car had been ransacked, or, well, searched, the valuables taken. You'd be like, where's my bleeding spare phone? You'd search all over your car for your phone. Then you'd realise that your phone's been stolen. You'd drive to the police station and the police would say to you, your fingerprints have contaminated it. Like, we can't do anything. And that's what I kept doing and I kept doing and I kept doing. The police knew it was me, but they couldn't like quite catch me and they was catching me for a few. And then in the end, they just gave me a straight asbo, check, arrested me for 76 thefts. <laughs> um Kept me in for six to six and a half days. Um, arrested me for one theft, then arrested me on 76 thefts. Went away to investigate all of these 76 thefts. Didn't even have one. They only had the one what they originally arrested me on to charge me, you know what I mean? So what they did is it was just keeping me in just to treat me like yeah, shit, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean, Colin? That's mad. Yeah. Is, was this like around the, like your first time you went to prison then? Or, you know... 
Well, the first time I went to prison was for um, robbery times two. I'd robbed two heroin dealers who were selling on my estate, not from my area. Okay. They came to my area to serve up, but the, one of them used to buy weed off me because I used to sell weed in a block of flats, 10th floor, black door. And um, that was me, yeah. So that was my drug dealing spot. And so he used to come and buy weed off me and then I'm sat there one day and I'm sat with a gang of um, Irish friends who I know um, and they said to me, do you know Fingy Bob selling on down there on the canal bridge? I was like, what? He's selling beeline him? Are you kidding me? He shouldn't be selling smack round here, getting everyone addicted to smack. Nah. So I just walked down the road, seen some lad on the canal who I barely knew, vaguely seen him before. I went, do you want to come and do a graph with me? He went, yeah, yeah. And he had the machete on me. I don't use machetes. It just happened to have one. I passed him the machete that I had on me. Walked in the house, knocked on the door, walked in the house, took the jewelry, took all the rubbish off them, the drugs off them, walked out, the, the machete got through in the back garden. I've gone about my business. A day later or two days later, I get arrested for robbery times too. So the guys had reported me to the police and the machete was used as evidence, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, good. But it was, you know... It, it was all just from drug money basically. I was just excuse. It was just an excuse. So By that was, time, I'd been, a, been a, become addicted to so, crack cocaine. So crack cocaine, you, you've I discovered. Took over. Yeah, How took old were you? Life. I was a teenager. Um, what happened was, is I was in a nightclub and I used to sell pills and we used to sell whiz and ease and all that and just piss about. And sometimes I sell fake ease if I couldn't afford real ease. You know, just put mm. um, <laughs> just a tablet in them like a tablet where I get you high or something. Yeah. Um, or even just complete bash, just a fakey. And um, I'm in a club, I've just saw, I've just got about 600 quid on me and I've seen this girl dancing around. She keeps giving me the eye and she says, I said, where are you from? She says, oh, I'm from around your way. Like, it turns yeah. out she's from my, my way, local to me. She took me to her house and sat there, sat down, I'll never forget it. And she went to me, have you ever tried cocaine? And I went, I've tried it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, like a dickhead. And he had two drags of it. Um, that's all I'd ever did before. And then she come in with this pint pot. It was a pint pot with foil on it and an elastic band. A pint, yeah, with a, yeah, I yeah, know. A I've pint seen pot, pipe. So she came in with a pint pot pipe with ash and crack on it. And now I think back, she must have put about a 10 pound piece on the pipe. You know what I mean? You know, right. to get me proper yeah. addicted. And she just went suck on that. And I just, with all my might, just sucked it in. And the minute, the second I sucked it in, I went to my brain, that was the most beautiful drug I've ever had. I'm <laughs> yeah. going to be at it. I'm going to smoke that every day until the day I die. So I said to myself, go. Yeah. I said to myself, I'm going to be an addict. I love it. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Went to my best mate's house without even thinking and went, try this. It's brilliant. It's better than pills. He's like, really? It's better than ease? I was like, better than ease. And I got my mate, and bang, I had a dig, I did. People don't realise, do they, the taste? This no, is everything about it, innit? It? Yeah, it's a very, very addictive drug. And it's very, very, it's very relevant we're talking about at the minute as well, Colin, because cocaine is in, is seeped into society so. now. It's absolutely everywhere. I was talking the other day about it, right? And I was saying that they need to get a grip on it eventually. Right, all drugs are used in medicine, right? Your heroin, your, your cannabis, your LSDs, your, M your MDMAs. It's all yeah, yeah, used. Yeah. It's all used in medicines, yeah. all right? So they're being used anyway. But what's going on is no government knows how to go to a third world country and get them rich by saying, we want to buy all your product, what you grow naturally, Bolivia or somewhere. We can turn you into a, a first class country if you supply us all your cocaine and we'll distribute it to every addict relevantly, if you're an addict, instead of you losing your house, your life, you're, you're leading, if you've got a little problem with this little bit of powder, when it comes down to it, Cullen, we are living at the moment in a science fiction movie without realising it, because I'll tell you what, if I wrote a book saying you could be arrested for changing the chemical compounds in your brain, you would think that was a science fiction movie, wouldn't you? Of course. Yeah. yeah, looking at that, it's different, yeah. Wow, it is different, isn't it? Yeah. So look at it that way for just one minute. That tiny chemical, you are ingesting it. You're not giving it a kid to ingest. You're taking it, you yourself. 
you're not doing no harm to anyone else around you. you do, you're taking that little chemical compound, slightly changes the, the compounds, other compounds in the brain. So it always it comes down to that tiny little thing what controls so much, all right? So I think 100 years from now, it'll be looked at like we look at the wild west of America where they could walk into a saloon, a saloon, kick the doors open and shoot someone dead at the bar, couldn't they? Yeah. If you had a name for yourself, you could just blow someone away, couldn't you? Now, these, these laws for murder, right? So in 100 years, there'll be laws about drugs and they'll look back at now and they'll think, wow, that time when drugs was illegal and people was being made homeless just to change the brain chemicals yeah. of the brain. <laughs> Like they was making people homeless and people was dying over it and yeah. for just that little tiny chemical compound what you can buy packets of now in the shop. Yeah, yeah. Because here's what I look at. If the local news agent who's got no experience of any drug whatsoever can sell you alcohol and that that drug alone, you could go out of Killer. your building, drink as much of it, lose your mind and go and, and slit someone's throat and without even giving it a second thought because it's a very mind altering yeah it's aggressive isn't it aggressive yeah it's aggressive you know you growl off alcohol don't yeah. you yeah you growl off it right so i think that they're gonna look at and think this now this time now we're living in we're living in a crazy time we're living in crazy time they need to get a grip on it. We need drug consumption rooms, I think. That's yeah, why well, I, I stand for that. Well, I think even yeah. I think even more deeper than that, I think they should be available on license. I think drugs me as a as a user. The problem drugs, is though, Marv, sorry, it's yeah, it's not what you're doing to your body. Yeah. It's like you said that I could stab someone and I think it's the recklessness behind it. Do you know right. what I mean? That's the yeah. problem. But I'll tell you what, right? I've got experience of all drugs, and I'll tell you now, there ain't no drug what's more violent than alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, none of them are worse than alcohol. None of them. No drug will make you worse than alcohol. All right. <laughs> Come on. I'm talking about like physically dependent on it and what you do physically. Right, I'm yeah, not about the actual. Yeah. Person. So here's what I think: what should happen? I think it should be subsidised, so people who can't quite afford it but would like it should be able to. Try have it. a little go, like if they wanted a little quarter of a gram in the evening with the wife, and then you know, it items a sexual drive, <laughs> sniff a gram. They've got a sign a form, a waiver saying it's not going to be used in front of children, it's not going to be given to children, sold to children. You know, you go to a proper chemist and get it licensed, and they give it you over the counter, and you've got a license for it. So, if you're allowed to go into a fruit machine and put 900 pounds in in an hour. On a, any, in an electronic device and all that is doing is changing the, them compounds in your brain anyway with lights because that's what it's doing it's doing, the, it's doing the same things as drugs with lights and you get your brain that into it you start thinking Fuck, this is great I'm putting my money into this I want more of them flashing lights I want them free lights to flash there I'm going to put all my money in you know you zoned out on it if you're allowed to do that why can't you go and buy a little quarter, quarter gram of Bolivian cocaine, just just not. Well, at you're all. speaking it um, in the position of someone who is actually being prescribed drugs that would normally be illegal. Uh, do you want to explain them? What, what, have yeah, you got so them? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So have yeah. you got them on you? Yeah, I've got them somewhere. Maybe yeah, you so can show uh, the camera and stuff. Yeah, you know? so I get um, I get uh, for my pain. So cannabis has been one of those drugs what's been made illegal for thousands of years, but it's completely harmless. But it's got a lot, a lot of medical benefits. What are used, and it's been used for thousands of years in every culture in in the world. Yeah, so it's been so used. This is obviously, just one part. You got two. Yeah, right? yeah. So obviously, it's it's been used. So I came down to just show you Ooh. that. So so I'm not supposed that's, to. That's proper bad though. Yeah. So I came down to show you that you know that like just for the filming purposes, but. You smell that yeah. Do you smell? Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Can you see that on the camera? So that's perfectly legal for me that to uh, consume at home with on a vape. So I'm allowed to vape that at home. Vape, yeah? yeah, I'm allowed to vape that, yeah, for pain. Um, so I just thought I'd show you. Um, it's got my name on it. Yeah, it's just a proper prescribed pot of um, cannabis flower. So I could have got either cannabis oil or cannabis flower if I wanted. 
But the thing is, um, uh, the novel is not with the, the novel is not there. It's but, worn off now, isn't it? But yeah, the novel, it's crazy. No, I'll tell you now. <laughs> I'll tell you now. Before I got a license for cannabis, say like the best weed, like oh yeah, it's Blue Dream. It's great. Uh, uh, the novel is completely worn off it now. I just use this for pain. Do you Relief. think that's what, like, because I think if we did, like, do drug consumption rooms for, like, heroin and crack and places yeah. like that, yeah. I think the same way, like, everything's taboo, it's the novelty, in it. You're yeah. doing something you're not supposed yeah. to do. But when I don't, it's, I don't when think... it's in control, I think people won't even want to use. Well, yeah, I don't think a drug control room would do it because you just sat there cold, 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 cold using with different addicts and they're learning different tricks and nah, trades. I don't think you do it together. I think nah, it would just be I to think, come and fix, fix yourself yeah, for, for that it, hour. Yeah, just for you. Like, yeah. There's no, it, why are you going to, why would they give a gang if you're... Yeah, they're not, I'm not talking about an opium den, fucking hell, yeah. I'm yeah, talking I know about like saying. somewhere where they go yeah. to get their, their fix yeah. and fuck, that's it. Yeah. And at the same time, they have appointments, you know, something yeah. to eat. Well, that's what will happen soon. You know, all those type of things. That'll come soon. Yeah, I, I think soon. I think we should because we're we're giving them all the needles and that in the needle exchanges anyway. Yeah, well, there's some countries. The well, Portugal's a very liberal country, yes. isn't it? I mean, yes. in Portugal's you get caught with any any drugs in Portugal and they treat you like an addict. They don't treat you like a, a criminal. Uh, a criminal. We should never go to jail, me and you, Mav. No, I know, I, I know. Um, I think I think I should go to jail for committing crimes because I'll tell you why. Um, what about if it's a pattern of behaviour and petty? Like, if it's the same thing over and over again, shoplifting, shoplifting, shoplifting. But you need if help. you're going to kill someone, then I you get it. Like, help. you need to go to jail. Yeah, you need help. But then, then again, I understand that jail's a deterrent. So I've been addicted to crack and been a prolific offender. And when I've got out of jail, my discharge money is going on crack. Of course it is. Right? You thinking, I were me last week. You did. Not even that, though. Some of my weekly money, what I'd be getting on wages, I'd just I'll think I'm not spending that. I'll just yeah, leave that yeah. there, build up. Get a nice <laughs> little 240 for when I get out and buzzing like yeah. a total wedge. All <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I'd do yeah, my jail yeah. thinking of doing that. Yeah. Way, you know what I mean? Just I've had to... it where like, I've had stuff on the, you know, I'm grafting and whatever, and someone's like brought money in off a visit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when there's that. cash flowing in, I say, I'll have it, and I'll keep that yeah, for my I've done myself, yeah. I've done yeah. that myself and wrapped up and kept it since I got <laughs> out. <laughs> on visits, innit? Like, yeah, oh, yeah, give me some yeah, cash. <laughs> yeah, bits of cash, yeah. A lot of people get cash on visits, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> what? I, I, I want to, like, go back a little bit and we'll talk more about yeah, the drugs yeah. in a bit. But Manchester, yeah. that's your, that's, you, you sound like you're from fucking Cody. Yeah. Manchester, Salford, them ways. What was it like growing up? Um, Paint a picture. Beautiful people on my estate, real nice people, or the women and the people who, um, like my dad was like an oddity, you know what I mean? It was like none of the other kids used to get what I used to get. Um, not that I know of anyway, um, but that the people who I grew up with was really nice, family strong mm. people, do you know what I mean? And like, there's a couple of women who, there's a couple of women who did me proud like there was one woman who used to hire a coach in the summertime and take all the yeah, kids yeah, yeah. to like Drayton this, Manor yeah, 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 so, know, yeah. Right. so Mrs Mason lovely Pat I love you so much Pat for doing what you did I swear you don't understand I didn't have that as a kid my mum and dad luckily we went to Blackpool every few years mm, our treat though, yeah. our treat was like sitting in a black pool and getting fish and chips in a chipper. That was our treat. You know what I mean? That was a black pool treat once a year. Yeah. So, um, the Pat Mason and stuff, getting a coach and getting all the kids on it and taking all the kids out. And I can remember being sick on the back of the coach and the women coming to tend to you. You know what I mean? And he used to love that me. Yeah. That was really nice. Yeah. Fond memories. Fond memories. Yeah. But, um, Home life wasn't uh, the best. What yeah. about um like uh the crime drug use? Like I'm talking about now growing up. So you've got the prostitute, the red light. Right. District. So I was what else? I was committing crime from very very young, and I was taking chocolate bars out the local news agents, and I was doing that continuously, going in, taking them, taking them, taking them, <laughs> until one day they told me dad, and my dad battered me that much. They'd never told me dad again because right. they they saw it, fucking hell. We just we haven't yeah. done him a favour. Mm. Wow. Wow, that's that's bad. Mm. So, your criminal activity 
what kind of stretch from what shoplifting to comfort eating as a bit as a kid comfort eating chocolate bars then it was what in a shiny tie yeah so i remember getting nicked with a kid called nemo in um in lewis's <clears throat> and and we was only young only kids and we're swinging on this garden swing and um we went to get out and we got nicked off this street theft woman and grabbed us both and got the police you know what i mean uh, and that was one of my earliest memories of of, of uh, getting arrested in town. But then, as you get older, the police know you're just a nuisance pissing yeah, about in yeah. the city centre, you know what I mean? But, like, we was... There was a lot of gangs of us in the city centre. Like, was there was loads of from people from different areas used to congregate in our city centre. Mm. So you'd have, like, Moss Side boys, Cheetah Mill boys, um, boys from my ends, other boys from different areas. And we'd all just, like... Longsight and Hardwick in the surrounding areas. I would all just meet in the city centre. So on a Saturday, you'd see gangs of us in the Arndale centre all just walking around slow. You know, there's different crews all walking around. And um, it was, that was, seemed so like uh, innocent. And then it just turned into like blood baths. You blink again and it's everyone shooting each other. Do you know what I mean? Because there's money to be made and drugs money to be made and People are being hard done by or people are being ripped off and these drugs and his money being involved and then it just all turned dirty and murky, you know what I mean? Everyone split off into all separate factions. Separate cliques and factions, you know what I mean? Mm. And then it, uh, a couple of the guys who used to hang around with me when I was a kid, one of them was a major gang lord, you know what I mean? A big, big, big in the game. He ended up being killed tragically. When you say gang lord... What, what what made him a gang lord? He just everyone had look up to him, and he was just like classed as one of the main boys. Yeah. I think he earned it, you know what I mean? I've done a lot of stuff behind the scenes, yeah, a lot of stuff behind the scenes, and earned his earned his stripes type thing. Because mm. you can imagine earning your stripes in Manchester is not like earning your stripes in in Cardiff. Like you're gonna have to go like proper. You're gonna have to be a proper proper boy. You know what I mean yeah. to get any recognition in like uh, Manchester. It's much bigger. Ooh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's much bigger. Yeah, and there's a couple of kids who who come up with names who who lucky they've not been shot dead. You know what I mean? Because that's what happens if you get a big name for yourself, and you do something wrong to someone, they're just gonna shoot you. And if they can't deal with you, you just get shot in Manchester. You know? What yeah. I mean? well, I remember watching a shoot. Man. You. you remember the film Everybody Loves Sunshine. So uh, it's based in Manchester. I think it's DJ Goldie. All oh, right. But it's, it's like, a, I think it's Moss Side and I okay. think it's Triads, maybe, I think. I don't know, it's a wicked film, but you need to watch it. But it's about I'll Manchester. Oh, yeah. And, All and right. It's a 90s film. All oh, right, I'll yeah, check it out. Proper gritty, like, do you know what I mean? Okay. But obviously, Gun Gunchester, as yeah. it was renowned. Well, Gunchester, my God, what I did is I started going to that area um, to make money because I ran out of ideas. And I didn't want to rob on my own area, right? I didn't want to rob my own. So I went to where the drugs was, like where these people, cars come in to buy drugs and stuff. And uh, I was living in and out of empty houses and smoking in people's houses and staying there the night and making money and doing that. And I ended up starting uh, serving up if I could, okay, burgling if I could, uh, breaking into cars if I could. Robberies if I could, robbing drug dealers, robbing drug users, all right? So <clears throat> we're on an estate, me and my mate robbing drug users, or punters and that. And um, I've gone, I've gone on to, I've gone, the next day I've gone onto this other estate and I'm stood there and this car goes past me and this guy's in it and he goes, Marv, you what it? So I jump in the car and he goes, see what it is, bro, you're in trouble. So I said, why, what have I done? He said, right, you're not going to get shot, but you're going to get beat about for robbing shots on the estate, all right? And I was like, fucking hell, man, give it a break. And he's like, nah, man, you took the fucking piss, man, these people. This punt has phoning saying, like, you robbed them last night, you know what I mean? They won't come on the estate to buy any more bits off us and that. And I thought, oh, shit. So he said, just take a beating, in it. You know what I mean? It's only a beating. And I thought, fuck it, I will. And um, on the way around, I said, I'm not going to get shot, am I? And he went, nah, nah, don't. You won't get shot. But don't start lashing out, throwing punches, you know, because 
Like, you know, one of them's just been shot in the head and he's got, like, the guy had a scarf from here to here. And he went, you know, the, one of them, like, you know, the, the drill. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sweet. And I got out the car with my hands. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. And he just started smacking me, like, yeah. And his son's there smacking me, yeah. And he gets this. There's an English English bull terrier. You know, the long nose stuff, like the one with the long nose. Horrible looking. <laughs> oh, mate, horrible, yeah. This starts chewing me and uh, it starts pulling you know it's locking on and it's just ragging me yeah it's trying to pull me to the floor it's ragging me <laughs> i'm thinking shit but i can't feel the pain coming because of the crack yeah so the coke's just completely pain killed me off i can't feel it and it's luckily it dawned on me i thought to myself this dog is ripping holes in me man and i can't feel it yeah i, I can see it I can see where it's just ripped and took a chunk out of my leg and left a big gash, big massive gash. I can see it, but I can't feel it. Marv, you need to make a quick decision because it's just going to carry on, aren't they? They're just going to keep carrying on beating you. Yeah. So I thought, you're going to have to scream here, mate. Do your best scream. So I started going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> ah! I'm sorry. Ah! Uh, so and it's kind of stopped. <clears throat> and I've, I went to walk away and for some reason I doubled back and went to say sorry again. Yeah, I don't know why I did it. Still started again. Oh, Same thing again. No. But this time, instead of the dog chewing me, it started chewing him. And um, there was firing air bomb repeaters at the dog to send the dog off the cake. Send it mad. So yeah, I went through that. And then um, another time, one of the one of the guys, completely my fault, completely me. Uh, one of the guys said to me, "Do you want to sell a few bits for me?" So I went, "Yeah, yeah, sweet." So he gave me some crack. I've just smoked it straight away. <laughs> so he seen me. He went, "Mav, don't take the fucking piss, man. I'm doing you proud here." Which he was. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, man, he was. The guy was giving me a little squeeze. You know what I mean? He'd see me on the corners, just trying to fucking hustle, and he thought I'd give him a squeeze. Might as well sell some crack for me while I drive around fucking shooting people, you know, because he was a gang member, right? And he was a shooter, yeah? So he was out shooting people while I'm selling his... Anyway, he's given me crack to sell it the second time. I smoked it. The lot of it. How much? Only about 10, right? 20, 200 quid's worth. And I thought to myself, oh, I'll get this on a graph later on. I'll yeah, get this yeah. on this graph later on. And I'm thinking, uh, I'll get the 120 quid, then it... I'll get the 140 and then it's gone up, it's gone. I smoked it all. I thought, yeah. shit. It's <laughs> like Wednesday and Thursday or something. I thought, shit, fucking hell, man. So I thought, weekend, I'll graft and get him some dough. So it's come to the Friday night. I'm a mate. I've seen him. He's gone, Marv, do you want to come to my side? Well, I'll go and get some crack. So I've gone, yeah, yeah, coming in. So I've gone in this, we got a pirate taxi, you know, like an unofficial taxi. Guy with dreadlocks, never forget it. So I sat parked up. My mate's gone in. Some guys walked over, see me in the back of the car going, Marv, blah, blah's in there, wants you. He cunt. He's fucking avoiding him, aren't you? And I thought, holy shit. So I've jumped out the car waiting for the boy to come. And the boy's come and gone, Marv, come here, you, man. Come here, I want you. Took me around the corner and just had this big fuck, pull, lift his waist up like I just went. And this big fucking revolver pulling, yeah, big long nose thing like that, like what you get in the yeah, movies, yeah, like yeah. Dirty Harry. I just went bang, bang, and his second shot, like, I think it knocked me to the floor, actually. I'm sure it dropped me to the floor and I kind of fell. Well, he shot thought, you. Yeah, and I thought to myself, fuck, man, I've been shot, right? <laughs> so I've got this big fucking bullet hole in my leg, yeah, and I go to the car, and I go to my mate, I go, bro, I've just been shot, you know. You come, what, you fucking, someone shot you. Who the fuck shot you there? Who the fuck shot him? Who shot at him? Shoot me, he's giving it. And I'm thinking, listen, mate, you don't even understand. They will fucking just start shooting us, mate. And I've gone to him, shut the fuck up and get in the car, you dickhead. They will fucking shoot us. And they've all come out of the club and all these guys, all these gang members. So we get in the back of the car, just as we, sh just as I shut the back door, the driver door opens and the raster guy just legs like that. I just see his dreads flying in the air. He's the, just the leg driver. Yeah, he does legs and leaves the car, leaves the keys in the ignition, thankfully. So I say to me, mate, come on, let's go. I drive straight past the hospital. 
like the hospitals on the way. I drive three, two, three miles to town. The hospital's a mile up going past it. Go to a nightclub, straight into the women's... Got to crack off me, mate. I'm sat smoking, cracking the women's toilets. And you know, like, toilets are a slight little drift like that, aren't they? To the, to the drains. So the blood's drift running to the drains because I'm in and out the toilet, like, can crack up. Trying to commando, you know, pulling my top off and trying to tie it and all that, thinking I'm commando, <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Thinking, ah, that'll be sweet. But what's happening is my heart's pumping faster. The blood's coming out of me quicker. And there's a right fucking pool of blood on the floor. <laughs> Some woman walks in and goes, ah, there's blood everywhere. <laughs> fucking hell. Well, so the guy who shot you. So my mate had to black bag his car you, up and take me to the hospital. That guy who shot you, did you expect he was going to shoot you when he called you? Possibly, yeah. Because he was a fucking shooter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you need a work uniform? Want to start a clothing brand? Or maybe you have a football kit that needs a logo printed? Well, if I was you, I'd get in touch with the Reinspire Printing Company down to Forest Industrial Estate for the finest printing and embroidery in Wales. I use them for my custom made mankini, but you could use them for t shirts, hats, hoodies, and many, many other things. What's, yeah. um, What's some of the some of the other graphs you used to do then? Was there any other type of ways to make money or? Oh yeah, well, I mean, well, you know, there's a thousand ways to make money. You know, you know, you know yourself as an ex user. Yeah, I know. There's there's millions of ways to make money. Sometimes it was credit card fraud. Sometimes it was shopping and robbing receipt, photocopying receipts. Sometimes it was just blatantly going in a, into a, a supermarket and picking up playstations. Did you ever do that? I used to do it. A lot. Well, walk out. See, Pick up a PlayStation <laughs> in the box and walk straight out the store. Yeah, I've done raggle ones. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should do that a lot. Well, they, yeah, let's talk I'll about some of your graphs. I'll tell you why they do it. I'll tell you why they do it, because you wouldn't expect it. Yeah, you've got to walk in, like you said earlier about the car. You you walk in like you own it. Yeah, yeah, and just walk You're straight out. You're entitled to that. Yeah, yeah, I'd just pick <laughs> one up in the box with the alarms around, yeah. you know, the big lights. Brazen. I'd just walk straight out the door with it. Brazen. Just the, light, the lights. Beep, beep. I, um... But no. I had a mannequin before. Yeah. John Lewis just started, and and my co my uncle's fucking mad as well because John Lewis at the time the security didn't really know how the shop was working, and they had the Ralph Lauren section right as you go in the lift and you you come out of the lift, yeah. and there's the Ralph section, yeah, and you yeah. go back down, you're in the car park, yeah. You had the mannequin, everything. But I, what I used to do is I wouldn't take the clothes. Like I would go in there, I'd pick like an expensive jacket and go right. Okay, I take it to the till and I say, right, listen, I've got this already. Yeah. My missus has brought me a second uh, yeah, one, it but it's the wrong did. size. Yeah. Can we swap it? <laughs> yeah, you and can do they, that. And they give me like a gift, they give me a gift, or they, they give me another size, or give me a gift receipt, like, you know? <laughs> so uh, then I'd either sell the gift receipt yeah. half price or fucking... I'll tell you what I used to do in the 90s. I used to walk into a well-known uh, store, what sell designer clothes, and he used to have Ralph Lauren in little square. He used to have a big square thing on the wall, like a wall, like loads of little squares like that. And he'd have 10 shirts, different colours of all yeah. Ralph Lauren. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I would literally pick up 10, put them to my chest like that, knock the fire exit door to the, the, the emergency exit, <laughs> fly up to the top, pop the gate outside and just run gone standards and i was doing it a few times and i got a bad chase and got away you, you know got away, ran you? from it yeah got away i ran all the way past strange ways security guard behind me i'm thinking no way man and it's I'm a long road you know what that, i did I'm, I'm dropping him one at a time colin right he's chasing yeah, cause he me wants to get him, don't he? and i'm thinking is he gonna stop in a minute or what just let me take you know what i mean because he's going at least i've got like eight of him and i'm throwing him i'm thinking i've only got five left it's like I'm mario running. mario yeah. with a banana it's like throwing him Oh, more and more. And in the end, he fucking... I ended up getting away with two or something. <laughs> <laughs> and only because I, I only because I rolled him up and put him down my sleeve, so we thought I had none. I was like, I've got one left. Leave me alone. Yeah. And he just turned around. Have, you ever, done if, have you ever done the cheese runs? I'm not. I never really did you that. You can't tell me you haven't once done a I'll cheese run. I'll tell you what I did Desperado. once. Desperado. I'll tell you what I used to do. We used to lower TVs out of hotels, mate. Don't watch that. Shut up. Mate, I'd get my... Get the birds book to book a room. room and just lower the hotel with the bed sheet straight out the window, bro. Wow. And go and cash Jenny. <laughs> that is a good one. Standard. I used to, yeah. I used to start going cash generator, take a television off the stand, take the stickers off it in the queue, 
and sell it back to cash. <laughs> yeah, ask Kira. I used to take Kira. Yeah. I'd say to Kira, stand there in the queue, watch this, and I'd walk over. So first I'd put all the tellies so they're all closer together. Yeah. So when one's missing, they're not realising yeah, it's yeah, missing. Of course. Yeah, you can't That's why people gap. make mistakes when they when they yes. raise, you know, like you like people will just take all the bottles yeah. and there's a big gap. Yeah, you don't. And you know the check in security. Yeah, that's it. But I didn't care about security. I thought, you know what? It's like I'd go to shops that they were in security, yeah. Uh, but people would say, Yeah, but you get caught on CCTV, you'll get you know, certain shops yeah. you get a guarantee come back. Yeah, yeah. But as long as I had my smoke that day, I don't yeah, care if it. I get a comeback in well, six that months. That was me, that was me. I didn't bother about I always said that camera's not got an hand. It can't just grab me, yeah. so I'm not yeah, asked. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. Not, security, I didn't really want to be rolling on the floor with security. No, I didn't. And, uh, you know. no, no, that wasn't my bag, that chase game. Yeah. So I'll tell you one, one day, I've been chased off all the police and the security, and mm. I lied on the floor and pretended to be dead. And I don't know why I did it, cool. Right? <laughs> but I carried it on to yeah. the point where he was getting little pieces of metal and putting it up with nostrils to try and get what? them to move. What? Who uh, was the security guy? The police officers <laughs> round me over me going, he's blagging. <laughs> he's blagging. He's not <laughs> wrong with him. And all it was was, I'd just been nicked and I just didn't want to face up to the fact I was going back to jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've I just was like... lying there. I just wanted the, the air to suck me up. I was just like, I'm gone. Come Have on. you ever had it like where like you, you're going to court and you know you're going to jail? I've had it. Like, I, I faked... I faked uh, I collapsed in a courtroom. <laughs> Did you? That's what I mean. <laughs> Mate, fuck me. They were like, listen, if you if you fake a collapse, like you they'll go hospital and they'll change yeah. your dates. I used right. to do all that. My mate, the, the, the best one is in jail, isn't it? You know, I've you don't want to get moved. You don't want to get moved. Ship you out. You, you're moving. Over overcrowded. Yeah. Yeah. Swallow some razor blades. Swallow some yeah, razor yeah, blades. Yeah, yeah. They listen, I had my mate do it, <laughs> right? And he still went. <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. My mate said to me one day, lad, there's a parcel in the hospital now if we can get to the Aussie. Sweet, I'm doing it. On the buzzer, crushed, screwed loads of paracetamol, crushed them, spat them on the floor, yeah. put my fingers down my throat, made my eyes bulge and my mouth water. And went, <laughs> went on the buzzer and went, buzz, I'm just uh, overdosing, I'm dying. And he rushed me to the hospital, right? And the part, like the boys was behind me, like four, yeah. three. the parcel was like there. And every time I went, boss going to go toilet, the screw would leave that toilet and go past it. <sighs> and I was like, this one. And he was like, no. Come with me and take me to whoops. I was like, no, oh, mate. That's, that's the killer, mate. Yeah. I know, I'm not going to say no names, obviously, but like, um, yeah, like uh, a good one, a trusty one for that is a scalder. Just scald. I know it's horrible, but yeah. I've, I know someone who scalded his feet on part of purpose just to get at the hospital. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? But the things you do in jail, the things we do to get them, them bags, like, Oh, mate, I've seen some mad ones, I've watched mate. someone nearly snap their arm doing that, trying to snap their arm for something. Just to go hospital? Yeah, I remember once some guy trying to snap his arm. Don't know what it's about, though. It's just come to me then. My God, yeah. Crazy jail, isn't it? Yeah, mate, jail, right? For people who don't know, like, You don't want to be going there if you've never been it, do you? you don't no, because that. That, the start of it, isn't it? Like, that's the worst. Right. The start, the learning the ropes and... Paying £50 for tobacco and all that. Oh, no. You can imagine now. Prison. It's fucked. Nah, mate. I couldn't do jail now because nah. of that. You know, I like told, a fag. And my mate got out the other day, a friend of an old got out the other day. He said all the stuff on Twitter. So yeah, Cardiff prison, when I was when I was going, these are these are screws that have been there from like the eighties. Yeah, and all of a sudden. Staunch, yeah, gone staunch now, right? officers. And then towards the end, they they were like, This is bullshit. The smoking ban came yeah, in, Spice came it, in, right? and they just thought, you know what? Yeah. This is not what I've been paid for. Yeah. And then you get the odd you get the odd youngster come in yeah. who thought he knew everything. And the old yeah, screws yeah. were like, I can't handle this yeah. guy. And then they finally left. And then they recruited yeah. all these like now I see screws walk around the city centre because yeah, yeah. Cardiff's in the city centre. So they yeah. go on there and I look at them and I think, mate. Yeah. If you tried banging me behind my door, like... What year did you try Spice, Gordon? I tried Spice in 2013 in Stoke Eve. Wow, yeah. I was uh, I brought it to Manchester in 2012. Yeah, so it was around... So, uh, like, you couldn't buy it. You couldn't buy it in I the just, town. My jail, my, my jail time started when Spice just started to come right, in. Right, yeah. You know, right. when it got ruined. Yeah, because, yeah. Because I, I was a heroin addict. Yeah, yeah. I loved 
heroin in jail. And when yeah. Spice came in, yeah. it wiped out. It wiped out. Sebi. Didn't it? Yeah. So I was fuming. So I hated went, Spice. Yeah, they all went, didn't they? Because Everything even Sebi went, went, like, you know? Yeah, and even Subbies went. I used to love snipping, snuff, uh, sniffing Subbies. Subaru. Yeah, they did. Yeah. All night you'd on the mat, tongues, you get any of them, innit? Knife and everything's great. I used to clean my cell up every night, man. Fucking on a mad one, like you <laughs> yeah. know. But yeah, like you know, fucking spice was just different. But I, I was up Stoke Eve, man, and I was seeing JD bags, yeah. JD bags full of rice, like people throwing them over the wall. Yeah, it was JD crazy, bags, like yeah. four of them, like, and you open it and it's just yeah. spice. Yeah, it went crazy, didn't it? Because they found out the way out to make it, didn't they? The cheap way out to make it. All. Apparently, they're making it in the jails now with like. The cleaner, yeah, dipping the cleaning it in paper. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, the cleaning stuff they're using now. Yeah. The cleaning chemicals out there. Yeah, well, my uncle, Anthony, he, he, he got caught throwing parcels over park, went to jail for it, and the toxicology for that was battery acid, drain cleaner, and yeah. roach killer. Yeah, that's what I mean. And I was saying to you, and I was saying, you know that myth? They say, like, it's rat killer. You no, always think it's bullshit. No, you know when I hear, you know, you know, listen, roach killer. There's the myth in it, they say, right, that if a nuclear bomb went off, oh, yeah, the only thing to survive would be a roach. Roach, yeah, it's true. So yeah. if this kills roaches, what the fuck is it doing to you? <laughs> I know. Ro roaches and plastic are the only Mad. thing that's going to survive, right? Um, death in prisons. That's, that's sad. I've seen a lot of suicides in there. I've, I've seen, seen a lot. I'll tell you what. Give mate. me some stories. I'll tell you what. A tragic story. My a relation of mine killed himself recently in prison, um, which is real, 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 real sad. Uh, they don't report it at all, do they? It's always kept in house. Never expected him to kill himself. Never, never in a million years did I expect that boy to kill himself. So he must have been under incredibly intense pressure to kill himself, um, and it must. Broke my heart, really. It was only very recent as well. I'm sorry and, to um, hear that. Yeah, um, yeah. He's got got kids in our family, yeah. So he's gone now. Wow. He killed himself. Wow. I think I think prison is is pretty. I, I I don't know if it's still 23 hours a day, but mm. I think people are being banged up for quite a long time in there at the moment well, as well. Like we was talking from the start, we we'll go back to mental health, calling it. It's the levels of mental health, what you're suffering, isn't it? I mean, some people find jail really easy and some people can't do it. Cool. I mean, I was away with a boy once who was crying his eyes out. He couldn't do a day of it. Like, crying, literally crying. I can't do this. I want to be out there. I can't do the prison. You know what I mean? What kept me sane is knowing I was born there. I, <laughs> it did. It kept me sane. It kept me thinking, all right, this is not so bad after all. I was it's my born environment, here. yeah. I was born here. Fuck it. If I die here... Well, this is what I want to ask. What I'm Let me ask you the question. Did you ever think that you was going to die in the place you was born? Did you ever think, yeah. being born in prison, yeah. you was going to die in prison? Yeah. My adoptive sister used to tell me all the time I'll be dead by the time I'm 30. She, Because I was a raging drug addict by then. All the way through my 30s, she'd be like, you'll be dead by the time you're 30. And then when I passed 30, she was going, you'll be dead by the time you're 40. And guess who died at 51? Not me. She died at 51 of a drug overdose. Really? Yeah. She took drugs? She was taking uh, yeah, uh, prescription drugs. Yeah. Well, what dad, we could say... My dad was giving them all. It's a crazy story, but... It's a crazy yeah. world how things happen. That's, 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 the, that's the fact yeah. of it. What was the worst prison you went to? Um, Probably... Punishment jail, probably Stafford, HMP Stafford, when it was a proper old school punishment jail. No, I don't think that was that bad. To yeah. be truthful, every jail's bad because yeah. you're away from everything else. You're not living life, are you? You're just surviving. No. It's like you're in a, entombed in like a, a bleeding concrete. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, so I think all jails are bad. What I want to do, Mav, obviously, you've done a few podcasts and you've told countless stories I and they're have, all yeah. unbelievable. and Many, many stories. Stories yeah. for days. See, the thing is with um, when you uh, you tell the truth, you don't need that to good memory. My memory's like a sieve, just all right? Like, yeah. But I just remember my stories, like if you ask me something, I'll remember some yeah. bits, you know what I'm saying? And that's what Kara buzzes off. She says, your brain's like a sieve, but you all your stories, because you're bona fide, legit, you don't need to make yeah. things up, you know what I mean? 
Well, if anyone wants to listen to any of there's plenty of podcasts out there. On there's YouTube. more than enough, isn't there? What I want to do is I want to get your, uh, I want to get your take on a lot of things that are quite relevant. Yeah. First of all, um, is the talk of prostitution and um, adult work. Um, we live. We come from a life. Yeah. Where prostitutes are around us. Around. We know. About. We yeah, know yeah. them. We've grafted with them. Of course. <coughs> we've smoked with them. Of course. We know the reputation they have from the real world, yeah. how they're degraded and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're looked at as like a toy, aren't they? What's your take on the adult work industry right now, OnlyFans, this culture where it is so cool and hip to be this this type of um, work? Say? Yeah, well, it is, it is sex work. It's just another form of sex work. Um, and I think that the girls who are doing it and the boys who are doing it... Um, you're going to only come to a point where you're going to have to go into do a bit more deeper and do a bit something a bit more risque. Let's put it that way, yeah? yeah. You're going to have to continually be risque more and more, yeah. all right? Until the point where you lose your self-worth. And then that's when it becomes a problem because um, I, I know a few years ago I was speaking to a sex worker girl and she put it to me like this um would you consider me in a sexual position for two hours bone dry and then them lubing me up to try and make it look like get a good shot and i've been in the same position for two hours and you know when they put it like that it makes you cringe and like i'd never watch porn again in the same light do you know what i mean because I think to myself, them poor girls had probably sat in that position for hours to get the right shot. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like, I think to myself, wow, that's so difficult, that work, man. You're right? Yeah, so, yeah, of course. And the, the, the OnlyFans is getting to that that level. I think the OnlyFans are all, like, I, I see some of these people on social media who think they are above everyone, uh, you know, these girls on OnlyFans, and yeah. apparently the things they are doing is disgusting, foul, degrading. Well, that's it. But it's being accepted in society. But it's, it is. at the same time of them thinking they can look down at everyone, but they're doing these degrading things, they look yeah. at prostitution and street work like, ugh. Yeah, yeah. But to be yeah. honest... It's the same. It's exactly it's the video. same. You might as well be a prostitute. Yeah. And, you know, some of these working girls, we know half of them don't even want to have sex. They they they, they use it. other ways to like try and avoid or well, minimalize. If anything, like it's less painful for some of these street workers. I know it's risky. I get yeah, it. Yeah. But I just think the way that we look down at these these workers who are they're just a friend of habit. Yeah. You know, they and I think the other sad thing and the reality that people need to realize is half of these sex workers and these prostitutes on the streets. Yeah. If they wasn't on drugs, yeah. they probably wouldn't do this. Yeah. The fact that these OnlyFans, it's a choice. Yeah, that's they think it. this is like, uh, and it's bizarre to me. It is. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's very, very risky, and um, I think you end. You could end up in places what you wouldn't really want to end up. You force. You're not going to really foresee where it, how murky yeah. it can get. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. you, it's just obvious. It's like going to get I, more risky. I've seen videos of like women and all that who are single mothers and they're like, well, well look, I had a job and I couldn't yeah. afford it, but now, yeah. but now I make money and wow, well, well, yeah. well, and I get, I get that. Yeah, yeah, but I yeah. Just think I it's get not that a as good well, example. Yeah. And, and like, you want your kid to grow up and think all you done was just shitting shit on a camera or yeah. piss on a camera or yeah, yeah. You know, eat something or act like a dog. And you're just like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. and I just think as society, we're already dumbing down. Yeah, we are. Know, relying on technology and other things. Yeah, we are. This is just not good, is it? Yeah, well, consciousness is being dumbed down as well. And we're being simplified, aren't we? To just be simple and just go to work and pay your taxes and be a good little boy and not look any further than the end of your garden. Yes. That's what's happening now, you know what I mean? Like, uh, just be a good, a lot of abiding citizen, do everything what they tell you, you know what I mean? If you come out of, if you out of sync, you know, you, you get punished, you know, you end up uh, in prison or wherever. If you do something wrong, which is fair enough. I mean, society needs rules and it needs, like, things to stop, like, someone like me as a persistent offender, persistent criminal uh, offender, uh when I'm in the thro thrones of a crack addiction, I think there's got to be summit to get a grip on me. I, I don't think that 
it'd be fair on society to just let me free and roam the streets. That's why I think that drugs eventually, they've got to bring it under control in some way. Because these kids like me, and there's going to be a thousand more kids like me, who are going to get addicted to crack cocaine and go on their wild missions until they get lifed off or dead. Yeah. Well, you, you know, your growing up was abused by by your by, by your father. You said, and then you yeah. know what happened. Yeah. Uh, a bit bit later on. Yeah. But we could. It still happens now. Of course, it does. Yeah. But yeah. we'd like to think that we're more aware of these things, aren't we? You yeah. Know? But we like to think that we. It's funny, you know. Because I tell you what's funny. We think that we'd like to think that way, but in then the same breath. Um, it's never been a stronger time for uh, anti talking to the police. It's never been yeah. a worse time. The grass culture, grass culture. What, let's have a talk about that. What do you think? What do you think of of, of that culture of so, grassing? So it's a tough one. All right. So here's the thing, right? So when my when Kara got when I was with Kara and I'm in prison and she broke down to me crying and said this. When I was 15, I was being beaten up off a grown man, right? And being abused, physically and sexually abused. And I begged her to report it to the police, right? I begged her. And I looked at it that that's a sexual offender. If she's 15, she could be 13, she could be 10, she could be 12. If he's going with an underage girl knowingly, why is he not going to go with a 13-year-old? And it turns out that there was other girls around him who was young girls. So she told me, yeah, uh, uh, he was doing things to her. And I said to her, listen, she was actually working with the police at the time, like a child protection team. And she'd been working with them for a couple of years. And they'd been trying to convince her uh, to try and report what had been going on. And also they said to her that these other girls, these more victims, and it's, you know, we want you to be the one to find that strength to report him and get him, like, locked off, get him off the street. So them people don't live with criminals, right? These prisons within prisons in prison. Yeah, sex BPs, offenders, yeah. sex offenders do not knowingly associate with criminals, day-to-day -day criminals, all right? But I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. Like, I don't think people realise there's a line. And there's an invisible line that if you abuse children, you should have the full force of the law thrown at you. Or you should be dealt with, like, by the village... So you, yeah, hundred percent. I agree that you know, right. taken into our own hands, be a bit mad. But so you would say, yeah, like if someone's a nonce, I'm, I'm gonna tell the police. I'm gonna, I'm, yeah. yeah, yeah. What about? But then it's, but then I know then what you're it saying. Goes against all my natural. I know what you're saying. To, but what about for law abiding citizens? Then is it because like do, do you? That's think, the thing. Is the thing right? A law abiding citizen, I think he's fair dues, fair okay. game. Let them phone the police and get you. I've been, I've been locked up off a report, off a witness, loads and loads of times, and I've never thought, ah, oh, that witness come back in. I just thought it's a witness. So it's a non, it's a yeah, non-combatant. Yeah. It's a non. You're part of the game, innit? So you yeah. understand. You signed yeah, yeah. up to it's that. It's a non-combatant in the game, so you know I'm not gonna start like going mm. looking for him. You know what I mean? But like. But like even like when what happened to me and my partner phoned the police um, after I got a brain damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My partner phoned the police and stuff. She phoned an ambulance actually and the police came. But you know, you might as well. You phone an ambulance, you phone in the emergency yeah. service. You phone an ambulance and you, you phone in the That's better. <laughs> you phone in an ambulance and you, you phone in emergency services. So she phoned an ambulance and you know, the, when she tells them on the phone, my boyfriend's got brain damage you know you know like he's fucking blacked out on the floor screaming you know they know that yeah, they're yeah, coming yeah. they know something's happened don't they so you could you could name her you could call her what you want but she'll just shrug it off and just say get out of it 
she 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 was a, a child being abused off an adult she she needs congratulating for doing that yeah 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 fair play to her yeah and i think every criminal who's worth his salt would say if there was a sex offender at the end of the street molesting the children on the street um get him locked up yeah of course right yeah they would maybe they wouldn't phone the police themselves because it's something what would be very very difficult to do is like phoning the repeater but i did i reported uh um a uh, historic sexual abuse against me i had to for my own sanity right do you know what i mean so i had to report a sexual abuse against me you know and um it wasn't easy it wasn't easy are you at peace with all that would you say now or most definitely at peace with it all yeah i can live with it that's good i can live with it it's not only that it's still it's still my journey still not finished yet there's still a a long way to go with my journey because um i've got family I've got family new family right who i'm just only just getting to know and building relationships with while my old family are like falling by the wayside you know what i mean like i've been lot let down a lot yeah, off yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. family off a lot of family but it is what it is they they live their own lives they doing their own thing yeah. i can't do nothing about that right want to talk about cocaine and crack yeah the lines there yeah for years there's always been that like stigma or you know looking down at people cocaine users i don't touch crack you're crackhead yeah. you're crackhead yeah you're nitty and all that yeah so all right then i'll tell you how close it is um if you're sniffing cocaine at a party all weekend all, all night and then the person who's supplying the cocaine says there's no powder left there's only the rock there's only but i'm smoking now i've had enough sniffing i'm gonna start smoking it smoking co coke are you gonna say no as a as a as a sniffer not 100 percent of people are gonna say no so as long as 99 percent as long as it's not 100 percent of people would say no if 1% chance of people will try it, that means there's always going to be crackheads, right? There's always going to be people who try crack, fall by the wayside. Their lives are going to change forever because they don't know the strength and the power of the addiction, what they've got in their hands. They don't know how incredibly um, controlling it is, all right? It will take them into places and do things to them that they, they've never wanted to do before, you know, and that's what drugs do. You, you'll do things and... You'll act like you you're not you wouldn't have acted before you started using. So I think crack and powder are very, very closely related at the moment. Very, very closely related. Because I'm seeing more and more younger people coming forward saying, I've had an, a, a crack addiction. And it blows my mind, you know, it really surprises me when I see someone younger than me say, Yeah, I used to smoke crack. I think, why would you even dream of doing it? Yeah, but what blows your mind? Is it the age or is it the upbringing? Like the demographic? Probably. Because you was young when you smoked. Yeah, probably. Is it uh, probably the norm, the, the more norm, like, you know, the people who yeah, are students? Yeah, there's more norm. Yeah, all right. So I'll give you an example. Some girl came up to me once and was giving me the most biggest hug. Some only oh, young girl, about 19, and she was saying, after I watched your lad Bible, I stopped using and then I seen her about six months later and she come up to me again and she was saying, I've not used since. And I was so proud that just that one lad Bible story, I got that girl clean. Um, so I know that when you educate people on the dangers and you say to them, look, if you take cocaine, fair enough, you're going to like have it. It's an, it's an addiction, but it's a slow burner. Because with cocaine, you can leave it all week. You can go to work, have a normal life, knowing you're going to get a bag of coke on a Friday evening. You're quite happy to live like that. But with the crack, you won't. You can't do that. You want it every five minutes, not every five days. Why can't? Why can't you do that? Because the the power of the addiction, the <laughs> strength of it, it turns it into from one thing into something completely different. Right? Turns it from that 
weekend drug into uh, a, a minute by minute situation. Mm -hmm. Because it is a minute by minute situation. You know, I used to count money and I'd go get to like 150, go right, there's a there's, there's a an team. hour. There's a team. Yeah. That's like an hour 15. There's another hour. And I'd be like, I'm going to be ready out again by seven. You know what I mean? And yeah. count the money. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, don't you? You know, as a, an ex user, how we do. I find as well, though, someone like yourself, someone who just uses crack is more dangerous than any other. Heroin, yeah. Well, that's you know, the thing. Drug user. Right. So people used to say to me, what do you use to come down? And my answer to that is I don't come down. That's why you've got scars all over you. That's, That's why right. you've been to prison everywhere. That's, That's why you, right. yeah. you know, because That's true. that person who can't come down and is chasing that high, they That's will true. rob, they will fucking... Yeah. do whatever they got to do and that's get in right. sticky situations and that's what worries me that them these people out there like me who are gamers me yeah because it's, it's not just the game or the, it's the oh, I ain't touching heroin I ain't yeah. touching heroin to come yeah. down fuck yeah, that fuck yeah, that staying, I'm just, staying crack, up. just a crack yeah I'm yeah. staying up I'm flying I'm staying up all day long do you know yeah. what I mean and that's it yeah you don't want to come down like in prison you use some tech to smart them to come down chill out relax mm. and all that you're not using anything to come down off the crack like my mate, when I first started smoking, he was a very clever lad. He used to buy Valium. And just before he crack run out, he'd take loads of Valium, knowing that once the crack had gone, he'd lie down yeah, and he'd be yeah, yeah, yeah. out cold. I didn't even do that. I wouldn't take the Valium. <laughs> I'd be like, nah, leave the Valium, mate. Are you so you've how long have you been off? The 2012 I've been off the crack yeah well done mate honestly yeah thank you very much no yeah. nah, man respect I know not man easy. I know it's not easy bro you know of right hand actually yeah, right hand I know right hand. <sighs> well what I want to say is for someone out there now who is stuck in that fucking cycle they, listen they, there's a way out too busy to watch this because no, they're not in that me, cycle but yeah. please I'll tell you a few things a few facts right there is a way out yeah, you do not need to be an addict and you do not need to live that way if you don't want to. You have the power to say enough is enough. I have had enough and I'm going to stop it, okay? And once you realise that the power is in with you, it's like the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy gets given them red shoes and they say, you always had it in you, Dorothy. You just didn't know it, all right? So... Them magic shoes, you've got them. You can just tap your feet together like that and say, right, enough. I'm not going to buy crack ever again because I did it. I said to myself, when I get off this sentence, I'm not going to touch crack again because I'd, I'd found a new drug, to be fair. You know, I'd moved from one drug to another. So, you know. What was that? The spice. Like, the spice had just entered the prison system and I was literally saying, I've had enough of the crack anyway. I'm getting to the end of the crack because all the crack shit is backed yeah. up to death. It's weak as fuck. It's not like it used to be, you know. And um, I think I found a new drug in Spice, so I just switched my switched my addictive like personality from bang, bang, switched it over, right? Um, and then the Spice was a very, very, very big problem and it's a very dangerous drug and a lot of people, people who try it know how dangerous it is. So I still get the after effects of that now. I'll wake up completely full of anxiety. It's soaking wet, like drowned, like I've just come out of the shower, yeah? And I'll be rolling around on my bed, but I can't stop it. My brain is saying, Marv, why are you spinning around on your bed? But my body won't stop, and I feel extremely hot. And that's never stopped since I started using Spice. And I've been off the Spice years now. So you went from one to the next and then finally kicked the spice. Kicked the spice, yeah, and then I got yeah. clean then, yeah. Well, I didn't get clean then. I was doing balloons and that then. So what happened with the balloons? The balloons, mate, well... this is a big fucking problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big problem in the nitrous oxide, all right. So I wear these body belts now because my spine is destroyed. And um, it's just coming out now that nitrous oxide damages your spine and it makes perfect sense. There was nothing wrong with my spine before I take, started taking balloons. And I'm buying boxes and I'm sat there just doing box after box after box, which I was. And then one day, uh, I felt like a, I felt like the air go out my lungs, like, like my lungs just said, enough. 
and I've, I, I just, I didn't stop him then. I just, I slowly stopped the balloons, but I've not done them for years either. But <clears throat> um, it was, it was actually the balloons what I think has done my spine in. A lot of people, I, I've tried balloons and. I'm not gonna lie. I do get like the ring in ears, like I'm smoking a crack pipe. Yeah, yeah it's, well, it is called. So that's probably why you. But can you give that, paint that picture to the people for them to realize what what they're smoking in? Yeah, how yeah, it's like a it's like a crack in a in a, in a little um, tin. That is literally like crack in a tin. It, it's the same sort of uh, hit. It hits the same parts of the brain. Um, you get that slightly the same feeling. The only difference is with the cocaine is your taste in it and all that, and that gives you a whole different ball game of sensations and things. Because you you salivate, you salivate on cocaine crack, and you will just keep spitting. Yeah, your, your liquid will just keep running out your mouth, and that's because it's the most tastiest thing. Your brain is just switched on, and your brain is telling you, "Yes, I've got my dream." The thing, what it is, and your body will just go on to overdrive for it, and that's yeah. just the power of that addiction. It's the power of the drug. What, right? what would you say to kids then who are who are using balloons? Um, I'd say start cutting down now. Start cutting down. Have a look. Google balloons and back damage, and if you've got any bad back going on, your back's getting a bit sore, your spine's getting a bit hard to move. Cut down on the balloons quickly. Very, very quickly. That's what I tell you. Yeah. Define recovery for me, Lee. Recovery is being in a place where you are happy with yourself. Um, it's not what you take, it's how you're taking it and what levels you're dealing with it in the first place. And is it a problem? Are, are you an addict? Are you going out stealing? Are you going up to commit crime? Are you a nuisance to society? Are you a product? Are you be are you a useful product of society? All these things come into contention and are considered if you use it, you know? A lot of people work and still use. They don't see that as a problem. If they don't feel like they've got a problem, they've not got a problem, right? It's only if you tell yourself, you stand up, put your hands up and say, I've got a problem, I need some help, I can't do it on yeah, my yeah. own, then you'll get, then you'll realise then that, yeah, all right, then maybe you've got a problem. But until then, you know, you'll live quite happy telling yourself you're all good. So um, how I see it as is if you're happy within yourself and you're content that you've not got a problem and you're not an addict, and it's not something what you rely on to, like a crutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. We have emotional crutches. We have we have crutches, um, medical crutches. Like I'm on a, I get given a, a a tablet for that as like a mental crutch. All right, to keep you going. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a tablet I'm given, probably for that to keep my head above order yeah um and stuff like that but it's down it's it's used for ptsd that's what the drugs are used for and i take that and i feel okay and uh, good you know what i mean vicious circles give me like a typical like a, a brick wall that people will be hitting in recovery they, they, they that like we could probably raise for people to think okay well maybe it's not just me who's going through this um, relapsing. Relapsing is the biggest thing, the hardest thing to do. I mean, when you've been clean for a few days and then you relapse, you feel yeah, like it, don't you? Swear one. Yeah, you feel it, don't you? Yeah. And I think you should really... I don't call it relapse, I call it a blip. That's it. Because you've learned what call I a blip. time, innit? You know, if you, if you went on Sonic the Hedgehog when you was younger and you got to the final level and then the electric went... You'll remember all the ways to go and get you it will. much quicker, and that's you what will. I feel like. That's like, right. Yeah. You've been here before. You know what you've learned this time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think you know that's like a a concept that I don't like. Relapse. That's twelve no, steps. I don't like that either. I don't like. I don't like that. 
You think friend, relapse the biggest vicious circle? Someone came online last week and he was saying that they've had a relapse and stuff and I didn't agree with him. I was so fuming with him. I was like, no, you haven't. You've just had a blip. You've just went off your road a little tiny bit, took a step off that line, that straight and narrow what you're on. You've only took a step off it. It's not as if you just ran off into the woods and fucking... No, 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 no. You've only took a step the off. Balance. You've recognised you've done it. You've like relapsed. Fair enough. Bring yourself back. Me, I was lucky, bro, because... See, with me and drugs, once I stop, I never, ever go back to it again. Yeah. That's what I've found anyway all my life. Like, I've stopped something. I've never used it again. Do you know what I mean? And that's been with every drug I've ever had. You know, I've I've tried it, mm. and then I've had a problem. I've gone, right, that's enough. Like, the amphetamine, the acid, the bleeding weed, the, the trips, you know? Yeah. You stop it. The only problem, the only problem what I had stopping is the crack. That was the one what I had the biggest problem stopping. It took me 20 years to get off that. It's the one you said you take for the rest of your life, mate. It's so. the one what I said I'd take for the rest of my days, yeah. Well, let's talk about the rest of your days. What, what What's your future got planned, Mav? Um, anything you want to tick off that you want to do in your life? or? Um, I want to be content with my life and happy with my lot I'm not have to be searching anymore I don't want to search anymore I've done enough searching now ain't you tired I'm very very drained of searching bro yeah man I am tired of running around so I'm tired of trying to put on an act and trying to be nice to people who don't deserve it who should be nice to me not me being nice to them what am I being nice to them for they should be respecting the come up of me, of the battle I've taken to get to where I am now. I should be just some little scruff in a bin shoot me, in a bin somewhere fucking wrapped up in blankets. I shouldn't be telling the world how to do it. You know what I'm saying? So if I can do it, anyone else can do it, you know? Yeah, man, that's, 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 that's really nice to hear, mate, because you're right and... From what I've learned off you is you are that big friendly giant who have cared for other people. Mm. Like you said, be your dad. You know, you come full circle with that and mm. you could have treated it another way. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm. You never. No. You know, but this is about you now. About you enjoying your life. Yeah. And it's it's, it's about time, isn't it? It is, yeah. It is. Um, I wish I didn't have a brain tumour to contend with. Frontal lobe brain tumour. Well, That's quite ball ache. You know what I mean? Got a did, frontal lobe tumour here. I've got a brain tumour right in the centre of my eye there. How, how, how is that? I don't know how it came. I went to hospital. Like I told you, I got attacked in the house. She phoned an ambulance. The ambulances came, rushed me to... The ambulances came and the police came together. As soon as they seen me in a state, they threw me in and drove me straight to the hospital and just dropped me off at A&E. That's what they did, just dropped me straight outside. Just like, fuck, you know, that's how bad it was. And um, I went in and they said, you've got a shadow in your brain. And that was that. I got a few weeks later, wow. they found a brain tumour. Yeah. So I walked in the neurosurgeon's office one day and he's got a picture of an x-ray of my head in this x-ray. And it's just this black and white picture of a skull. And you just see this big white circle right in the centre there. Yeah. So you're dealing with that at the moment? Yeah. It's hard to deal with daily. Yeah. But I've not relapsed. I've not turned to... No, um, exactly. Yeah. That's, and that's the positive you want to take out of this, and hopefully yeah. people will take from this as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, you all they've been thrown at you and everything yeah. you've gone through, you are now yeah. clean from, yeah, man. from the drugs that have kept you prisoner for so long. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Clean as a whistle, yeah. Won't even dream of it. No illegal drugs in my system at all now, you know? I think today has been really, really nice. I do. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, meeting you eventually. We've been speaking for over a year. We have. Um, definitely get you down again. Hopefully you and your partner. Yeah, that, that would be, be good. good. One. That would be good. Yeah, Maybe get Clara as well and all four yeah. of us have like an interview. Let's have it. Let's that would be good. That. Yeah, we'll that, that would be good. Yeah, all right then. Um, you've put something in plan there. You've just, <laughs> you've just put the seeds down, haven't you? Yeah. You've just put the seeds in the garden there. 
what we do with all our guests is Make we get them ten commandos. Yeah, what do I mean? We get them to leave a positive message down the camera to whoever it is really that okay. you want to reach us out to. But okay. really, leave us with something, man. I'll leave you with, you can do this. You have got the tools, the keys. Every bit of knowledge is contained within you to get clean. You don't need no um, guru, no master, no one to tell you that they know better than you. You have got it within you. Just tell yourself you are going to do it and you will do it. You will find yourself doing it. Trust me. If you tell yourself, I am going to stop this today, you will stop it today. <laughs> hey, Marv, I like that, mate. Yeah, Honestly. Man. You don't take life too serious, man. That's what I like about That's you, bro. It, man. Smiles all day, That's bro. It, bro. 100%. Yes, Honestly. You know that, Thank bro. you for today, brother. You're welcome. You're welcome. Very, very welcome. Guys. Thanks for having me. Please. It's only £10. Yeah. All right. Fiverr on Kindle. Fiverr on Kindle. Ten pound yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. Go and show your support, please. Um, like I didn't really want to go over all the stories of Marvin because, like I said, at the podcast he's, and this he's book, thirty chapters, guys. I've just he's non-stop. got a wild story. Honestly, please go and buy his book. Honestly, um, thank you. You know. You, you, you've got a good art, Marv. Thanks, bro. You've got a wicked art, you know, nice. and that radiates. Yeah, nice one, bro. Respect. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, guys. Um, anyone out there going through a rough time, you've it's never it. too late. You've never too late. You've got Please this. leave a comment. Go and follow Marvin and stay central. The Central Club. <laughs>